Uh, I know that it's going to be a tough evening, and, uh, but it's really nice to be here. I'm so grateful for the invitation, not just because I've always been a great lover of IFO, um, but also because it gave me an opportunity to go and visit your great state opera over the weekend. And I heard my hero, Jonas Kaufmann, singing Fidelio, which is a great experience. And uh, also a delightful L'Elysée d'Amore last night with a cast from all over Europe of brilliant young singers. So it's been wonderful to be here. And of course, then, then there's all the Bavarian food. Uh, where, where can I stop? <laughs> so, many, so many great things in Munich, you know. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation. And I've got some slides, as you can see here, but I thought I'd do something more informal, just to start off with. I've got here a piece of paper with my thoughts. And I thought I'd tell you my thoughts before I give you a kind of slide, a little bit more detail on the slides, uh, about you know, sometimes we say in economics, when you've written an, a big piece, you know, and someone says to you, okay, there's your paper and your book or whatever, but tell me what's on the back of the envelope? What are you really saying in three sentences? So what I want to say to start off with is what I'm really saying in a few sentences. And so I, what am I saying? I'm saying that, you see, at the heart of this whole process is most of my fellow economists don't seem to be aware of many of the facts, but the biggest fact for me about the European Union is that it's very protectionist. And it raises a big tariff and non-tariff barrier wall around the EU in the interests of two main industries, food and manufacturers. And the political economy of why, why is that wall so big around those two industries is because there are two major countries in the EU called France, which has a lot of farmers that are politically very powerful, and Germany, that has a lot of manufacturing companies that are very powerful. And political economy tells you that the two most powerful countries will inevitably support their own lobbying uh, groups and interests. So political economy tells you it's not surprising that the EU is protectionist, but it's an important fact that we need to take, in, take into consideration. And the scale of it is huge. Like the, the, the tariff protection around food is 20%, and that's and that probably doesn't take account of the non-tariff protection through things like the, the, the difficulty of the US selling GM foods in Europe. So 20% plus for food. And on manufacturers, the figures show 20% tariff plus non-tariff barriers. The non-tariff barriers be mainly through discriminatory standards. Well, not overtly discriminatory standards, uh, but standards that are drawn up to suit internal consumer interests and also producer interests. You know, the classic discriminatory standard that isn't really discriminatory in technically is the Japanese ski boot. If you want to sell Japanese ski boots to Japanese, they have to be special ski boots that are just right for Japanese feet. And only it just so happens that the only people that can produce those things easily are Japanese producers. But of course, anybody can obey the Japanese ski boot standards. It's just very expensive to do it. So effectively, it keeps out a lot of producers. So these are non-tariff barriers that the EU uses, mainly in manufacturers, but also as we've seen in food. So these numbers are big. So 20% is a big level of protection. And many of my fellow economists have said, oh yeah, there's, there's free trade inside the EU, but they forgot to mention that there's inside the EU, 
or protecting that free trade inside the EU is this enormous tariff and non-tariff barrier wall keeping out the United States and all sorts of other fine producers. And at the heart of my argument, what I'm saying is the UK is better off with free trade. That's why this thing is called a free market macroeconomist. I'm a macroeconomist primarily, but I do work on trade. And um, it's, not, it's not exactly, you know, rocket science to say free trade's a good idea. And the British consumer, if the British consumer could have free trade, it would mean that they could buy from the rest of the world. And some people say, there's a choice here. Either you buy from the rest of the world, UK, you, you, UK guys, you want to buy from the rest of the world, but if you buy from the rest of the world, you'll have trouble buying, having free trade with the rest of Europe. It's either or, you have a choice. But I say it's both and, because as I'm going to try and persuade you this evening, it's pure common sense that the UK and the EU should have a free trade agreement. We don't want to levy tar tariffs on each other. Nor, by the way, as I'm going to argue, can we levy non-tariff barriers against each other because of rules of engagement about standards and how borders work, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So I'm saying, look, the UK wants to have continued good relations with, with, with the EU. We don't want to erect tariffs. We don't want the EU and ourselves having tariffs against each other, nor do we want to be keeping each other's products out. We just want to have continued normal trade relations as we've had done for a long time. But in addition, we want to be able to buy from America and from Japan and from South Korea. We want to have free trade with the rest of the world. So both and. And I don't think there's a choice here. That's what I want to really persuade you this evening. And I also want to persuade you that it'll be good for the EU if we leave because on the doorstep of the EU will be a new competitor that will force the EU to become more sensible in economic policy, be more free market. That's why I'm a free market macroeconomist saying it's win-win. It's win for the UK because we, we get access to free trade. But it's win for the EU because the EU will no longer have a captive UK market to which it can sell stuff at inflated prices. And it will also face competition in ways of doing business that at the moment are suppressed by the fact we have a common regulatory structure with the EU. And competition in regulation is, is a very good thing, I think, because it stops, it stops governments becoming too interventionist in the, in the affairs of the economy. And when we've left, we'll be there across the channel competing hard with, with free market regulations and much less intrusion of government into the affairs of the economy. So, free trade is an important thing and it will make our economy more dynamic because what will happen when we leave the EU is that those prices that have been raised by that protective wall will come down to world prices and that will benefit our consumers and also put pressure on our industries, whether it's the car industry or any other bits of manufacturing, to become competitive with world prices. You know, it'll put pressure on them to improve their, their game. So that's, that's the guts of my argument, that it's win-win. It's good for us because we get free trade. We maintain a good, uh, a good, access to each other's markets through the EU because we will have a free trade agreement with the EU. I think anyone who says otherwise is, is talking nonsense. Why wouldn't we have free trade with each other? You know, and at the moment the, the European Commission has gotten to its head that it wants to give Britain a punishment beating. You know what I mean? They got the big cane and they're out there flogging us. <laughs> 
saying, you dare to leave the EU empire, you beastly Brits. I'll show you. Whack! Take that, you dog. And don't anyone think they should do the same, because that's what happens to dogs that leave the empire. So that at the moment is the game of the European Commission. Punish Britain for the effrontery of saying it wants to actually, you know, run its affairs this different way. Now, some people say, and, and they're not only here in, in Europe, but also in the UK, the, the UK Treasury, for example, say, it's not really possible for the UK and the EU to have a, a free trade relationship. They say, inevitably, once you're outside the EU, barriers will come up at the border. They say, you know, the border man at the customs will say, Aha, I want to look inside your back, your back axle and check you out and make sure all your paperwork is absolutely hunky-dory. Which is a funny English word for absolutely correct. <laughs> and beyond reproach. And so the border will become very hostile, you see. This is the argument. The border will become very hostile. All those customs people will be standing there saying, uh -huh, you know, you're Brit, you're Brit. Don't come another inch without showing all your paperwork, you know, in triplicate and all the, all the stuff that you, you... Make sure that your beef is absolutely pure, you know, and, and they'll crawl over it, you know, like a bunch of flies, you know. This is sort of... This is sort of, this is the image we're told will happen when, when, when we leave the, this, this market. And similarly, uh, another big worry that the Treasury has raised, and many people say, well, also standards. You know, at the moment, all your goods satisfy the standards. The, the, the EU goods satisfy the UK standards, and the... UK goods satisfy the EU standards, because, of course, they're exactly the same. But after leaving, you know, there'll be like a sort of... Uh, a UK good, when it comes to the EU border, will have a sort of special spot, like sort of have green eyes or something, showing that it comes from the UK. And the standard will say, yeah, you're OK, except you've got green eyes. You come from the UK. And so... Don't come in. Now, actually, one of the things I've been saying to Her Majesty's Treasury and also to my friends over here who make these arguments, <laughs> excuse me, is, look, the thing about the relationship between the UK and the EU, it's not the same as if the EU, as if the UK had never been in the EU. The UK has been in the EU for 45 years, by the way. 45 years, 45 wonderful years, say. And it's not reversible. It's not the same as a country that's never been in the EU, where the standards are different. If you've been in the EU for 45 years, you have the same standards as, as the EU. The EU and the UK now have exactly the same standards. And you can't suddenly, the moment we leave, say, all those products that have the same standards, for some reason, don't have the same standards, because they obviously do. And th there's another point, that even if the standards change, the exporters who export from the UK into the EU will have a very strong incentive to keep on to keep on matching the standards of the, of, the, of the market to which they're selling things. There's a big sunk cost in trade. And so if you match a country's standards to which you sell, and they change the standards, which of course the EU may do, or we may do, the EU exporters to sell to us will, will keep on making their goods satisfy the standards. Because of course, you sell to this market, you want to make sure you keep on selling to this market. And any exporter makes sure they comply with the standards of the market to which they're selling. And vice versa too. UK exporters will make sure they comply with any changes in EU standards for their export goods. <laughs>
So even if the standards change, which they may do, exporters will continue to conform because they've always conformed and for them, the marginal cost of conforming to any s changes will be so tiny relative to the, the sunk cost of having conformed totally to these standards that they'll, they'll do it. So my point is this, the standards of these two economies are exactly the same in trade. And so the relationship on standards is not reversible. And there's another point. WTO rules, which the EU embeds in its own laws, and of course we would do the same, pro prohibit discrimination in standards. So if a country's exporters satisfy the standards, that's the end of it. You can't say they satisfy the standards but they're from country X that we don't approve of. That's discrimination, which is outlawed under WTO rules. Another thing that's outlawed under WTO rules is what I'll call rogue customs behavior. Under WTO rules, the, the borders must be seamless. You have to have pre-clearance pre via computer so that inspections at the border are minimal. And if you look at the statistics, the, the, the world the World Bank publishes statistics on logistics, including these border, uh, these border statistics. You'll find that the typical developed country border inspects only 2% of the traffic that crosses it. The other 90% is pre-cleared. So these borders have exert very little border cost. They are basically frictionless. The cost of border procedures is, has, has more or less gone to zero. Now, of course, when the EU set out to create its single market and its customs union, this was not the case. 45 years ago, the WTO had not really invented any of this stuff. But, of course, the, and the EU was stood out as having seamless borders and, you know, seamless recognition of standards and, and non-discrimination and so on. But I think what's happened is that international trade community through the WTO has caught up with best practice as practiced by the EU in its single market and so forth. And that best practice now is what holds across international trade between non-EU countries and the EU uh, as well. And so when you think about what the UK's relationship with the EU will be after leaving the EU. It will be a non-EU country that will have exactly conformable standards that its exporters will continue to conform to and has frictionless borders because that's the modern border is frictionless. I visited Bristol Ports, which is the main port taking in all car imports from outside the EU in the UK. And you, you go, if you go down the M5, you can see this port. And it's a great big car park full of imported cars. And the, the fellow that runs it and owns it is a, f is a friend of mine. And he, he's one of our group that campaigned for Brexit, as a matter of fact. And when I visited his port, I asked him, where are the customs officers? He said, oh, I don't know. I don't know, we never see them. We never see them. I think there are like a dozen somewhere. They hide away. We never see them because everything is pre-cleared. Everything that comes through our port goes through just like that. No customs officer comes near it because it's all done by computer. It's all pre-cleared before it gets to the port. So it's a very interesting thing. I was quite surprised. I said, are you really serious? No, you never see these customs people. And he said, never see them. Don't know who they are. And this, these are guys that are the customs people for his port. So, so that's my first point, is that free trade, the UK opting for free trade, doesn't mean that there's a choice of having very frictionless, very frictional trade with the EU.
And that suddenly, when we choose free trade, we stop having a good trading relationship with the EU. All that will happen is that we'll default to the position of a non-EU country that has the same compatible standards of its exports with EU standards, and also has, like every other non-EU country, frictionless borders with the EU. And you know, you can look at the trade figures for non-EU countries. They've grown much faster in trade with the EU than have EU countries. So it can't be, I can't be making this up completely, can I? If all these non-EU countries have such good trading relationships with the EU, why shouldn't the UK continue to have good trading relationships with the EU? So, to sum up my first point, I say it's both and. And for the UK, what's not to like about free trade and competition and productivity growth? And what's not to like about continuing to have good relations with tr in trade with our close neighbours, which of course we all want? Now, let me make... Um, a, let me build on that to say that there are gains, therefore, from a friendly Brexit. At the moment, Brexit's not very friendly. It has to be said. Brexit at the moment is punishment beating by Mr. Juncker. And who is he punishing? The British people. Now, if I was Mr. Juncker, I'd be a bit careful about punishing the British people because the British people have a quite serious view about democracy. And they think that if they've had a referendum, politicians better respect it. And any politicians that don't respect it are going to have a very bad time in the next election, which is why both the Conservative and the Labour parties have said that they back the referendum. Um, so, so, there are... There are gains from a friendly Brexit that I've sketched out. The gains on our side is that we get to free trade. We don't have to cope with this. We also get to our, control our own regulations, which is important. And also, we maintain friendly relations with our biggest neighbours. Um, but then we get onto the sort of hard stuff. Suppose it becomes unfriendly and there's no deal. Um, one of the things that we've done work on is what happens if there's no deal. Because very early on, when I was campaigning for Brexit, people would say, oh, you know, you say there'll be a deal. But actually, they'd then produce a European politician who would say, ah, oh, no, there will be no deal. Mr. Verhofstadt, perhaps, would be the favourite one to be in a... In a, in a, in a, in a BBC studio, Mr. Verhofstadt, who is the favourite the favorite European politician of the BBC. <laughs> because he's a complete unpleasant idiot. <laughs> so that any time any Brexiteer came into a BBC studio, out they would, out they would wheel Mr. Verhofstadt or some picture of him and they'd say, look at this man Verhofstadt, he will not give you a deal. He is very against everything you're saying. To which the answer that we've, we've, we've researched is, then we will have no deal. <laughs> if Mr. Verhofstadt is typical, and he seems to be quite typical of quite a lot of the Brussels politicians, then we will have no deal. So what will be the effect of no deal? Well, under no deal, we will have free trade and we will have no deal with the EU. We'll just have WTO relationships with the EU. So what about that? What about that? Well, the point then, that defaults to WTO law, which I've just described to you. WTO law means you still can't discriminate on standards. You know, just as the EU doesn't in practice discriminate against all other non-EU countries, under WTO law it could not discriminate against UK trade, nor could we discriminate against them. And also, the borders would have to be seamless. So under WTO no deal, you still get all these things going through. That the UK goes to free trade, and it's simply 
has WTO relationship with the EU. And what is that relationship? It's perfectly okay. It's no discrimination on standards, so the goods still have to go across the border. There's seamless border, so the goods still going across the border at very low cost. The only thing that no deal means is tariffs. But the thing about tariffs is that because the UK will be doing free trade deals with the rest of the world, goods will be coming into the UK at world prices. So anybody from the EU selling in the UK market will have to sell at world prices or they won't sell anything. And anybody selling out of the UK will have to get at least world prices or they won't sell anything either. If you work through the economics of that, it means that the guys buying from the UK exporter will have to pay them the UK world price and absorb any tariffs. And vice versa. You know, anyone selling, um, anyone selling from the EU into the UK will only get the world price. They can't raise the price to, to, to absorb the tariff. Because if they do, they won't sell anything in the UK. So if you think through the logic of that, it means that the tariff revenues that are, that are imposed either by the Commission or by the UK Treasury will all be absorbed by EU traders. Now these, these tariff revenues aren't chicken feed, as we say. Chicken feed is also something, an, an English expression, which means the stuff you feed to chickens, it's very small. So uh, these, the, the thing about these tariffs, they're not, they're not very small. The revenues that the UK Treasury would charge would, would be 13 billion a year, pounds. And the revenues that the EU Commission would get would be 6 billion a year, pounds. Sorry, I can only work in pounds. I'm not yet fully enough educated in the Munich climate to convert myself into euros. So I, I fully apologize for this lapse. But pounds, anyway, nowadays the pound and the euro are more or less trading at one, aren't they? So it's not much different, luckily. So anyway, a lot, a lot of money here is changing hands, and it's all paid for by EU traders. So, so basically that means that the EU is going to lose a lot from this tariff war. Well, it's not something we really want, but this is something that would be expensive for the EU. Another thing about no deal is that the UK won't pay any money into the European budget, the EU budget, for the next two, three years, which is currently, it's paying quite a lot of money each year on the basis of a transition, you know, under the withdrawal agreement, under an agreement. But if there's no deal, there'll be no money for that. So when you add up all these bits of money, also Brexit will come two years earlier, which also is costly because it means that BMWs, you see, will immediately have a price fall in the UK instead of waiting two years. If we go into a transition agreement, BMW, Brit the Brits have a love affair with BMWs. I expect you all know this, don't you? If you scratch a Brit and ask him what does he really love, he says, after my wife, a BMW. <laughs> and maybe even before my wife. <laughs> so, you know, they love BMWs, but you see, the thing is, if you can buy stuff from the rest of the world that's 20% cheaper, and you've been paying you know, your enormous price for your wonderful BMW, you come all the way to Munich to, to, to get, you see, you say, well, hang on a minute, Mr. BMW, you know, give me a, give me a cut here of 20%, because now I can buy you know, this other stuff that maybe not quite as good as you, but you know, I can still get it, and I could get some satisfaction out of it. So, the price of BMWs will fall. And so, no deal costs the EU. We did the present value calculation. I'm sure as many accountants here and so on, finance people will know, you know, discount present value, all these flows to present value. It's a cool 500 billion pounds in present value, this cost of no deal to the EU. But it's a gain to the UK because we get out faster. We get to free trade faster, and we get all this tariff revenue, and we don't pay the EU Commission, whom we love so dearly, moi, moi. You know, we don't pay them 30 cool billions. We don't pay them. You know, Mr. Juncker can sing for his money. <laughs>
And so we gain from no deal. So what we find is, bring it on. If, we, if, if we're going to have a fight, bring it on. You know, I'd strip off here and put on my boxing gloves, you know, but that might not be a good idea because I'm not such an impressive figure as, you know, uh, Muhammad Ali. But the thing is that no deal is bad for the EU in pure euros. Present value, 500 billion. And it's good for the UK. Present value, 650 billion. So, so the point really is that we want a friendly deal. And the point I would make is it pays the EU to have a friendly deal with us. I'll make another political point. If there's no friendly deal between the UK and the EU, the enmity won't go away in a generation. Already, British public opinion is pretty aroused about all this. and They think the EU has behaved, the Commission's behaved very badly. Now, imagine if there's no agreement and, you know, this goes on and on and on, and Mr. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Selmayr gets up to even more tricks, because he doesn't seem to like us very much. Uh, then, you know, this will leave a residue of bitterness which will endanger good relations in lots of other ways, you know, which we don't really want. Okay, so that's basically my summary of what I'm going to say. And uh, those of you that want to switch off my slides can now switch off because I'm going to talk about my slides. And um, I'll also say a few things for Professor Felbermeyer about trade theory, but... I'll, I'll tell you all about that when the time comes and the slide, the slide appears because I, I, I won't spend any more time on my sort of my brief summary of what I'm going to say. So let, let's, now, let's now go into my slides. And I've got a few things to tell you that are slightly more detailed. So um, first question, everyone asked me, why are you leaving? What went wrong? So... I thought I'd give you a little history of what went wrong in, as Gabriel very kindly said, I, I produced this book called Should Britain Leave the EU? An analysis, an economic analysis of a troubled relationship. Obviously, this is a relationship, isn't it? I asked my daughter about her relationship. She doesn't tell me very much. But this is a relationship, isn't it? We had a relationship. As my daughter said, I had a relationship. I said, what does that mean? Anyway. I guess she knows what she means. You probably know. Anyway, we, we had a relationship, so something went wrong. I think that's the fundamental question because people ask, well, what went wrong in our relationship? And the thing is that it's not rocket science. You see, the problem is the EU doesn't have a demos. There's nobody you can point to and say, they love the EU. They would sacrifice themselves in the war for the EU. You go to a country and you say, would you die for your country? People would say yes, and they have died for their country. Who's going to die for the EU? Nobody loves the EU. Inside the EU, there are Greeks, there are Germans, there are French, there are Spanish. They love their countries. And they would probably die for them, and they have. But the EU is a nothing place. It's a kind of a sort of imperial, imperial palace, isn't it? That nobody loves. And there's no democratic control of it. The European Parliament is not a democracy. It's not a democratic organ, is it? It's a bunch of people that all dislike each other sitting in Parliament, having to talk to each other, which they dislike intensely, you know? And basically saying, well, th those are the Spanish over there and those are the Greeks over there and we don't talk to them. And, and they're the French and they think, they think they're wonderful, uh, you know. And, 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 and there are the Germans and they actually run the show, you know. And, and, and so, so what is that? Is that a democratic organ? I don't think so. And this is the fundamental problem. Now, you see, you're dealing with a country, the UK, that has a very profound sense of democracy. It's fought lots of wars. It's fought, it's had civil wars. 
vicious civil war. We had the most vicious civil war in the whole of world history in the 1600s when we were Catholics versus Protestants and so on. And of course, we have very strong democratic rules as a result of this. Why do we have them? Why do we pay so much attention to these rules of democracy which say, incidentally, if you have a referendum, you don't then declare we're going to have another referendum until you get the right result. We don't believe in that sort of thing. Now, why don't we? Why do we respect these rules? Whereas the EU seems to brush aside all these rules the whole time. Why do we respect them? Because we don't want to stop, we don't want to kill each other. Because if you, if you don't have a set of rules whereby if you have a disagreement, there's a way of settling it by whether it's parliamentary elections or referendum or whatever it happens to be, then the only other way of dealing with it is to go to war with the other guy and start killing them until the best, the man who's killed most wins. So democracy is it's taken very seriously. And the problem is that because the UK, very old democracy, prizes this, they felt they were losing democratic control. And then there was this federalist political union agenda, which you all, I'm sure, approve. P people in Germany approve of federalism in, in the EU, but the UK doesn't, doesn't, doesn't think the same way. And then all this stuff about Subsidiarity is a joke, isn't it? There's no way of stopping anything in the EU. If you are a minority, there's no real serious minority blocking mechanism. And of course, because the mantra of the EU is ever closer union, the UK suddenly started to realize they joined a club which wasn't an economic community. It was a political union in which they had no democratic a control. And, this, and this, this then brings me to what they say in French, un peu d'histoire, a little history. You know, in fact, if you go back over the history of UK-EU relations, they've not always been bad at all. Mrs. Thatcher was very pro-EU. And interestingly, she pushed the single market very strongly under Monsieur de Law. And so the single market came in largely as a result of the efforts of Mrs. Thatcher, who was used by Monsieur Delors to push the agenda, and I think Germany also supported it, against some other countries that weren't so keen. And what Mrs. Thatcher pushed for, you see, was free trade. She thought the single market would bring in free trade, competition, mutual recognition of standards, and an independent monetary policy. She thought all this would go with what was proposed under the single market. But as we all know, there wasn't any free trade because it made no difference to the basic protectionism of the EU. And Monsieur Delors, once the single market was agreed, switched to uniform standards, so all that idea of mutual recognition and competition of standards, which was Mrs. Thatcher's idea, went out of the window. And he also instituted the social market. So instead of being an instrument for free trade and competition, it became an instrument for social democracy, which was definitely not the vision that Mrs. Thatcher and her ministers had in mind. And then, of course, just to capital, Monsieur Delors then trampled on the idea of independent monetary policy and went for the euro. And when challenged as to why the euro was a good idea, because the economics of it were so transparently awful, and I can tell you that, having taken part in the debate uh, with, with Hans-Werner Zinn as well in, in over the euro and the unwisdom of it from an economic point of view. What Delors said, and many politicians echoed him, was it was a route to political union. So you can see that not only was he smashing Mrs. Thatcher in the face and saying he was going to take away her monetary policy, he was also going to use it as a weapon to get political union, which also was against the whole idea of the single market originally. So, you know, you look at this history and you say, well, why did Britain fall out of love with the EU? It's pretty obvious why. And this is the reason. You know, it didn't happen by accident. It didn't happen by accident. And UK got lots of opt-outs from Maastricht and so on and fought bitterly about them. But 
the UK got more and more discontented. And I'll give you a statistic that you probably won't often hear. People say, but half, you know, a lot of people wanted to remain in the EU. But shall I tell you the statistic? 80% of people in the UK, we know this from polling of people's views about these matters, 80% of the people in the UK are Eurosceptic and, and share these worries. This is why nobody fighting for the EU, staying in the EU, ever mentioned politics once in the, in the referendum. They all, they all mentioned economics. But what happened was 80% of the UK would have voted to leave, but half of them were worried about the economics. So, so it all came down to everybody wanted to leave, basically, but half of them were a bit of frightened that the economics, you know, might go sour. So this history, you see, highlights that there are good reasons for that 80% feeling, and that's why no British politician will ever make a good political argument for being in the EU, whereas, of course, that's not true in Germany at all. And so when you come back to recent events, you see, then there was the huge inflows of, 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 of migrants from Eastern Europe, three million now, uh, just over one million of them unskilled workers who create a lot of disruption in poorer communities because they all get access to taxpayer benefits in the UK under the UK's unconditional benefit system. And that taxpayer subsidy, you see, to unskilled migrants from the EU cost 20% of, uh, is about 20% of their wages. And it, it, it also drives down unskilled UK wages. So this is an, a, a more recent phenomenon. And then you had the financial crisis, which also created general concerns, of course, and a general feeling of unhappiness, which played into all these issues and fueled the UK Independence Party. And then you got the promise by Cameron to head off the UK Independence Party, you see, of a referendum in which the people's will will be executed by Parliament. So people sometimes say, well, the referendum was only advisory. No, not so. The referendum was promised to the people as a way of saying what Parliament should do. There's no question about that. You can read all the minutes of Parliament. And so that's what, that's what Cameron promised. And he did it in order to counteract this dissatisfaction that was now being exploited by UKIP you know, uh, because uh, fueled by the extra austerity fatigue and, and immigration issues. And so, you know, that's the background, that's the history. And now, let me give you the economics of, 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 of leaving. I'm just going to give you the unvarnished figures from our work on what we gain in the UK from leaving. The first thing is free trade, 4% of GDP. And that's not a stupid number, by the way, because the Australians did a calculation using a big, uh, a big world trade model called GTAP, um, which found that the Australian liberalization of their trade policies had gained 5%, 5.5% of GDP to the Australian economy. I mean, the Australians were very protectionist, and of course they got rid of it. So these sorts of numbers aren't, aren't unreasonable. And I'll show you some numbers from GTAP for the UK later on. So that's the first thing, a big gain from free trade. Um, secondly, a big gain from replacing EU regulation, which is very interventionist, it's very social democratic, very intrusive. You, you know all about it. I'm not sure that everybody approves of it, but it's a kind of, it's approved of by social democrats, and that's the, that's the ranking political makeup of EU politics, isn't it? Social democracy. But you know, we're not particularly big on social democracy in the UK, and a lot of this regulation is pretty bad, pretty bad from an economic point of view. And we calculate that, you know, we could get rid of about a, a, a third of it, and that would gain us 2% of GDP. And a lot of that gain would come from less intrusive regulation of innovation and, 
energy and finance. All of these areas that are very important to the British economy. And then they come to the, the wage subsidy to unskilled EU immigrants, um, which is quite expensive. It's 0.2% of GDP, it's 20% of their wages. It's also quite expensive to unskilled UK workers because of the effect on wages of, of, of these unskilled uh, U EU immigrants. And so there's another element. And then, of course, there's the, the good old budget contribution. And when you add all these things up, it's about 7% of GDP. It's about 135 billion. And quite a big gain to, to the Treasury's revenues from, from higher GDP, of course. So these are the figures, and they come out of our research on um, regulation comes out of a lot of our work on the supply side during the Thatcher era, and also some more recent work on growth. And the wage subsidy to the EU we just get from our benefit system figures. They're, they're, they're very generous benefits, as, as you probably know. And then, you know, the free trade gain is based on a, on, on a, on a world trade model that we've developed ourselves, based on classical, basically a classical world trade model, which I'll explain a little bit more about in a minute. And this is where all the, the argument starts, because you get into this business of, you know, the Treasury, Her Majesty's Treasury, HMT, you see, HM, Her Majesty, you see. We all love her. You know, she's our queen. You know, the EU Commission thinks Mr. Juncker's more important than her, but we don't agree. <laughs> we don't agree. But Her Majesty's Treasury, that are very anti-Brexit for reasons best known to themselves, claim that we got the trade all wrong. It's really a 7% loss. I'll talk about that a bit in a moment. It comes, it comes from these assumptions about the borders that I talked about earlier. That's really where that 7% loss comes from. And, you know, the classical approach basically is, is emphasizing comparative advantage. And one of the things that came out in this great debate on trade was something called gravity, the gravity challenge. And a lot of the trade people on the other side of the debate said, look, it's much more important avoiding barriers with the EU because it's your largest trading partner and gravity means that you trade most with your neighbours who are particularly your bigger neighbours that are close. You, that's the gravity idea. And therefore, you need to give that much higher priority than trade deals with distant other trading partners you see, and so out of this idea of the gravity challenge, as I've called it, comes the argument that there are inevitably going to be costs, barriers will arise by leaving the EU, contrary to what I said earlier, and that when you cost the effect of those barriers between the UK and the EU, these lose you more than you get from free trade. And that's where the Treasury's controversy came from and what the argument that they, d they developed as against the classical free trade approach that, that I, I, I kind of uh, briefly outlined. And what is this? So where did this free trade dispute come from? And this is, this is where I get a little bit more academic -y, for which I apologize. There's a lot of academics in this argument and You'll see here from my slide that uh, there's, there's LSE, Sussex, National Institute I could include in there, and also academics at the OECD and other such places have kind of coalesced around the idea that there are these big costs of leaving the EU uh, due to this gravity approach under which um, this trade is biggest and these costs will arise due to, you know, just having WTO rules. And so there's the gravity uh, arguments which I've just told you about. And the, the nutshell then is that, you know, how do you evaluate the costs of leaving the EU in terms of these barriers? versus the gains from free trade. If you go back in time to what the Treasury did, what 
what it did was use a lot of what I call gravity associations, data associations or correlations between trade um, in the UK and growth in the EU and other neighboring countries. Um, so if you go commodity by commodity, you can produce lots of these correlations which say that your trade is associated heavily, your trade grows heavily associated with your neighbor's growth. And uh, that, of course, is undeniable. And they call, we can call these gravity associations. The problem is that then they went on to say, um, you know, we'll use these associations to see what would happen if we leave the EU. And the way they do this is they put into these correlations special factors for being in the EU or being in a WTO relationship or other conditions of international trade relationship. And then they'd read off these numbers and say that's the cost of being in the EU on trade. But the problem is, as I've said, joining the EU and leaving the EU are not symmetrical. This is not a reversible relationship. So a lot of these associations were really just finding relations of what happened to trade of people who joined the EU and then assuming that if the UK left the EU, it would reverse these relationships. But this is obviously fallacious. It also doesn't tell you where the gains from trade came from, why the UK traded more with the EU. What were the factors, what were the factors driving it? Was it just the fact that there was more growth in the EU, or was it other factors that were also affecting, you know, what you produced? The UK, for example, is a big service producer. It produces lots of financial services. It doesn't just sell them to the EU. It sells quite a lot to the EU. But it's the world's leading financial center. And it sells all around the world. It competes with Hong Kong, you know, and it, it competes with Hong Kong, Singapore, and the United States, New York. It doesn't particularly compete with anywhere in, 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 in Europe. But, of course, that trade came about through mechanisms quite different from gravity. Basically, the reason for that trade came about because the UK developed expertise in services. And there was something called Big Bang, where the city was opened up to banks from all over the world, particularly American banks, who brought with them this huge expertise into the city of London and became a major source of world financial services. Nothing to do with neighbors or gravity, just a policy decision by Mrs. Thatcher's government to liber liberalize the city of London so that banks from all over the world would come in there and you'd get the best people supplying the best financial services in the world. So you've got to ask, you know, what's causing all this? And what, what this second bullet point says is the Treasury shouldn't have just looked at correlations and said, you know, here are all these correlations, these are associations in the past. It should have looked behind them for the causal drivers. What was really driving UK trade? What, what did policy do? What did comparative advantage do, factor endowments, you know, how much labor you've got, your education of your labor force, you know, whether you've got oil or whether you've got land, all these things are very important in trade, you know, if you've got lots of land, the city of London is particularly important, terrific, um, particularly important because it's got loads of land and there's plenty of space for city, city, bank to, 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 to be there, side by side with Deutsche Bank and the other big banks. There's loads of space. This is all very important in trade. So what we did in Cardiff, and this will be my kind of last point, we said, look, there's all these associations between trade and neighbors and one thing and another. Let's write down all these trade relationships and then let's side by side with it, put what we call a full CGE model. Now, what's a CGE model? Oh, my God. Computable general equilibrium. It basically means you write down a model of economic theory which says what people care about and why they locate in different places and why they produce what they do. And then you 
you ask, what would different policies do to this environment? And you also ask, does this model account for those trade facts? You know, all those correlations and so forth. And so we set up two versions of a world trade model, a CGE model. We did one version, which was a plain vanilla classical model based on comparative advantage and competition. And then we set up another one, which was based more on gravity. And it said, you know, actually what's important is not just all these comparative advantage things, but also, you know, what do these extra things due to closeness of neighbors, are they really important? Is it true that just neighborly closeness drives trade and that trade then in turn drives competitiveness because you get more investment because of trade? This is sort of back, back to front model of trade really. It says that trade is really driven by neighbors and then as trade is driven up by neighbors, you actually then invest more so you become better at it. So in a way, demand drives trade. So we put another model which had these mechanisms in and we tested them against the facts. And what we found was that statistically, this gravity model with these extra relationships, which was so important to the anti-Brexit case, was rejected statistically by trade facts. It doesn't match UK behavior, which isn't surprising when you think about it since the UK is so heavily dependent on financial services, which are obviously nothing to do with gravity. So this model of the UK said, actually, if you look at a gravity model, it doesn't do a good job of explaining the UK. Um, and the, tr the classical model does a good job. It isn't rejected statistically. And just to give you some ideas, this is a, I'll just skip over this slide. There's a bit more detail on this business of correlations. Um, and also this, this one. What I'll show you is some pictures taken from a paper I did, which is this paper here with a, a colleague, and you can, you can download it if you're interested. I'll show you what we found. And this briefly describes the two models. But what we did was we said, well, if you ask the two models to to see if they could replicate the trade facts by simulation. We basically have a technique here where we say, there was actual history, the trade facts, described by the trade facts. But these are two models which vie, are competing with each other to explain actual history. How do we know if they explain actual history or not? We create a thousand different histories of what might have happened if the shocks had been different. So each of these histories that might have happened describe how history might have been. And then you ask, did the actual history we get, was it very probable according to these implied histories of these two different theories? That's the, that's the method we used. And then you can, you can look at the probability. And so here's a picture of, of what happens here. These are, this is a diagram of, look at the bottom one here. Um, the bottom diagram, this shows along one axis one of these f fig uh, one of these numbers that describe the relationships in trade facts and the other axis shows another number like that and the red dot here, the red dot here this is the distribution of all these numbers that could occur according to the model. We're in all these parallel histories. And this red dot here, you see, is quite a long way up the hill, suggesting it's quite likely. Whereas the blue dot here, you see, is obviously way outside the hill and is rejected. So something like this is what the gravity and classical model look like in terms of what they say could have happened to these two numbers. And this blue dot you can think of as the gravity model and this red dot as the classical model. So what that's saying is that if you compare the distribution of, of the things that these trade facts with the trade facts that actually occurred, which are the two dots, 
one of these models is rejected. That's the, um, that's the one. The, there's, if this was the, if this was the, suppose this red dot's the fact, and that model up there is the gravity model, you can see the gravity model is rejected by the red dot, but the classical model, if this is the classical model, is, oh, thank you. Uh, the classical model here, if this was the classical model, and this is the gravity model, and this was the red dot were the facts, the red dot here would reject the gravity model, which it does, and would accept a classical model. Because as you can see, it's sort of somewhere up the hill, so it's more probable. So this is the technique we used, you see, to test these two models. And um, I'm sure you're very, you've understood perfectly what I'm saying. <laughs> so I apologize profusely for that. And you'll have to ask Professor Felbermeyer to explain it all to you carefully later. But um, th there's a table here which shows how powerful this test is. Uh, and it shows that basically if you've got a model that is 3% false, it'll be rejected 98% of the time. So that tells you that you better not have a false model on this test or it'll be rejected. So this is a powerful test. And I think here, here's some st here's a pictures of, of what it says. You see, the, here, here's some pictures of what each model says on average would happen to a trade between the UK and the EU, and this is trade between the UK and um, the, the North America, and this is trade between the UK and the rest of the world, and the, the thick line is the facts, and this line at the top is the gravity model, and this line at the bottom is the classical model, and you can see just from looking at these charts that the classical model is much closer to these trade shares on average that are, that are found in the facts. And in other areas, the two models are quite close. But when, when you ask about the correlations between these facts, you can see that if the classical model is so much more accurate in representing the facts than the, than the gravity model, the relationship between the facts that are represented up here, where the two models are quite different, and the, and, and, and the facts down here, where they're very similar, is going to be very much biased in favor of the classical model because it gets so much closer to these trade share behavior. So that's a, 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 quick, a quick summary there. Now, does it all matter for free trade policy? And the answer is, if you plug into the gravity model, you know, a full CGE gravity model, Brexit, you get good results, provided you put in the right assumptions. I mean, this is what brings me to my last point, which is that how did the civil service make GTAP, which is a slightly gravity-esque com computable general equilibrium model, generate bad results for, you know, the, 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 the Brexit? So let me take as my kind of main topic the WTO no deal case, where the Treasury and Civil Service, CS stands for the UK Civil Service, used this model from Purdue University called GTAP, which stands for Global Trade um, Analysis Project. It's a big model which they sell to governments, including Her Majesty's Treasury, to use. Uh, you know, uh, the Treasury could have asked Professor Felbermeyer, and he'd have got a much better model for his pains. I'd probably get it charged him less too, wouldn't you? I expect, Gabriel. So anyway, they bought it in from, from Purdue University, this GTAP model, and they, they reported using this model that leaving the EU would cost the UK 8% of GDP. This is this number here, 7.7. .7. How did they get it? They assumed these very large costs of customs and also standards, and virtually no gain from rest of world free trade agreements. This takes us to the kind of bottom line table. This is what the Treasury used, you see. They said, well, the tariffs, here's the WTO case. They said the tariffs will be 4.5% tariffs, which is about right, and that will cost UK GDP 
Then they said non-tariff barriers, which is all the standard stuff, will spring up at the border, 20% tariff equivalent. And that would cost the UK 4.5% of GDP. Then they said customs borders, frictions would arise, worth 6% of tariff equivalent. And that cost the UK 1.3% of GDP. So the total cost of tariff equivalent of leaving the EU in terms of barriers is 30% tariff equivalent. That's like saying that the tariffs the, UK, the, the EU would levy against the UK and vice versa are worse than the tariffs they levy against the US. It's massively bigger. And, and of course, this gives you your 7% cost to GDP when you add them all up. But these are enormously big barriers at the border between the UK and the US, which are simply uh, absurd in my view. And what we did here was we said, well, look, the true barriers actually for non-tariff barriers, for reasons I've told you, are zero. And the customs barriers are zero. So actually, the only barrier left is tariffs. Yes, that's 1% that's of GDP on the GTAP model. And so you get a total loss of 1% one, 1 of GDP. And when you compare that, when you look at doing deals with the rest of the world, you see, what the Treasury did was to assume that we do virtually no deals with the rest of the world, giving a gain of about 0.6% of GDP. But when we put unilateral free trade into the GTAP model, which is what you might call a maximalist free trade agreements with everybody in sight, you get a gain in the GTAP model of 4% of GDP. So what the Treasury did was to deny that their model gave any gains from free trade, which of course it gives 4% of GDP gains from free trade if you do proper free trade with the rest of the world, bring down all the barriers, you see. And they said it'll only be 0.6% of GDP. On the other side of the equation, which I just showed you, they said there would be this huge cost from all these barriers sprouting at the border between the UK and the EU, leading to a loss of 7% of GDP. So you get a loss of 7% of GDP against a tiny gain from free trade agreements. So obviously, the Treasury managed to make the case that free trade was, was, was pointless. You, you just better stay in the EU. So this was their argument. But it's totally riddled with holes because these assumptions are completely absurd. And, you know, my conclusion on trade modeling, which is where I'm going to stop, is this, that... To evaluate Brexit, you, used to, you have to use a full model because Brexit is a huge policy regime change and it affects everything. You can't say, you know, have all these regressions and correlations and keep the things constant on the right-hand side and say, we're just going to leave the EU and that's going to affect trade in such and such a way. There's, that gives you no proper estimate of the effects of a policy change. You have to work through all the causal channels to find out what Brexit will do. And there are many causal channels. Lots of things are changed by Brexit. You have to work through them all. And for that, you need a full model of the economy. And that's what we've done and what GTAP does and what Professor Felbermeyer does with his model here. Um, the other thing you've got to do is to, to test the model, if you possibly can. And we tested the model, and we said the gravity version isn't as good as the classical version. From policy viewpoint, it doesn't make so much difference, but it, it's important to, to get the model as right as you can and to use as proper tests if you possibly can. And the other point, of course, is the assumptions. When you put the correct assumptions of policy into any of these models, you get sensible results. If you put in policy assumptions along the lines I've explained the Treasury did that are palpably absurd, you get of course, the opposite result, which is what they wanted to get. Uh, but it's not a good scientific procedure. And so, in sum, you see, the Treasury, in its so-called latest project fear, said that the WTO option, the no-deal option, using GTAP with the wrong assumptions, gives you a loss of about 6% of GDP net. And... In their previous incarnation, when they used these correlations, they had a 7% loss of GDP. They abandoned that way of doing it in favor of using a, a, a proper model. 
But if you put into the proper model the correct assumptions that correspond to what's legal under WTO rules and, you know, what, what you get from unilateral free trade according to this model, you, you get a gain of 3% of GDP. And on our model, you get a gain of 4% of GDP, which is our final point here. So, overall conclusions I want to leave you with. I'm sorry, it's been a bit of a marathon. Um, what with my early summary and now all these details, you must heads must be heads must be singing. Um, so I apologise for that. But what I want to leave you with is three points. Classical trade theorists did a very good job. People with names like Ricardo, Heckscher, Olin. Their wisdom and the elaborate detail they put into their models, which I call the classical approach, is very good modeling. And it brings everything in there, all the important factors of comparative advantage, as well as all these uh, points about barriers at the border with uh, neighbors. And that approach fits the UK trade facts. And so I say, I say we need to give a few cheers to David Ricardo and his friends in the past few centuries. They got quite a lot right. And the modern, the modern obsession with gravity models has led to terrible fallacies. It, it's led to very poor modeling because economists have been willing to use correlations instead of proper models. And secondly, it's led to what I call the neo-protectionist fallacy, that somehow free trade isn't good for you. You're better off with protection which is a very weird conclusion, if you think about it, in the spectrum of economic thought over the centuries. You know, if you'd told that to the people who abolished the Corn Laws, you'd have got a raspberry. That's a British expression, by the way, a raspberry. It means something you throw at someone. It's big, big and red and very sticky and unpleasant. So you'd have got a raspberry from, from um, you know, the, the, uh, uh, those that abolished the, 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 the corn laws in the UK, which brought down the cost of food dramatically and laid the foundations of the Industrial Revolution in the UK. There's what I call neo-protectionist fallacy. So what we've had is a bunch of great trade theorists who've fallen for neo-protectionist fallacy and used the most diabolically bad modeling methods. And Professor Felwemeyer agrees with me about that because I'd checked with him before. I thought I'd tell you. I thought I'd share that with you, you know. Professor Felbermeyer and I are shoulder to shoulder on this point. Poor modeling. It's probably about the only shoulder to shoulder we have, but it's a good one. It's a good one. And my last point is Brexit is a move to greater market freedom for the UK in trade, regulation, and migration. And that's why I, as a free market macroeconomist, I campaigned for Brexit. Thank you.